This is a lesson on heat and heat transfer methods in the heat and thermodynamics unit. We've looked at heat and heat transfer. Heat, Q, is a way energy is transferred from one object to another. An energy possesses thermal energy, U, and heat, Q, is the transfer of thermal energy from one object to another. These are the units of joules. Energy conservation and state functions are the easiest way to quantify these relations. So we're going to dig deeper into energy. Heat transfer occurs due to a temperature difference and due to the first law of thermodynamics, heat always moves from hot to cold objects. And what we're going to study in this lesson is the three methods for heat transfer, which are conduction, conduction, and radiation. So your book, the OpenStax College Physics textbook has a picture in there that has an example that you are familiar of in your maybe everyday life or one you've been in for all three of these transfer methods, conduction, convection, and radiation. There's a fire here. There's some radiation. We can see convection going on with some air and also conduction. I'm going to define these more particularly in the next few slides. So hold that thought. What I wanted to talk about just for a second is the amount of heat and the rate of heat transfer, what they, that depends on. Of course, the mechanism of heat transfer is going to affect those things, whether it's radiation, convection, or conduction. There's some sort of efficiency involved in each one of those for heat transfer. There's the innate ability of materials to conduct heat. The areas and distances the heat must traverse. If you have a large distance, it's going to take longer and you might not be able to transfer as much heat. And the temperature of the original hot object as well as the receiving object, how long it takes to achieve thermal equilibrium for those objects. It may just take a little bit of heat transfer in order to balance them, or it may take a lot of heat to balance them. So we will consider the initial and final temperatures for those objects. The first heat transfer method is by conduction, where we see that kinetic energy is transferred on a molecular level through collisions of the hot object in the cold object. So we have two substances here. We have a hot object and we have a cold object. We'll just call those hot and cool, maybe not cold, but cooler. And so we see that there's a higher temperature, there's a higher energy in the molecules in the hot object. They collide with the lower energy molecules in the second object, and there's a transfer of energy, heat conduction. And that is the definition of conduction is when the molecules collide and this kinetic energy is transferred. As we saw in the prior slide, there's different factors that affect heat transfer. For conduction, we must consider the type of substance. Different substances have different coefficients of thermal conductivity, which we have as K. Yes, another K. We have a spring constant. You saw the Boltzmann constant. We have another K, which is the conductivity of the material. And note up here, uh, we have joules per second meter squared degree Celsius. There's a lot of things going on here. So when you look at the equation, it will make sense how many terms are in it. Up here we have watts. Remember, a joule per second is a watt. So a diamond, I can see, conducts heat very well, whereas air or polystyrene foam has a very low coefficient and they conduct heat poorly. These are good insulators. These are good conductors. This chart I found in OpenStax University Physics Volume 2. Now that we have an idea about conductivity for materials, let's look at the equation for conduction. And this is an amount of heat transfer via conduction. We can see that that thermal conductivity is in the equation, but there are a lot of other terms which I will define. And there's a picture here to help us think about what these terms are. Q is the amount of heat transferred. So this will be in joules. There's a time period. And so overall, you will see that this equation is given as a rate of heat transfer. So this is a time period. 
there is an area and when you look over at the picture here the area is the area over which that heat is being transferred it's not the distance it's transferring but it's the area over which it's being transferred the distance d you can see in the denominator here is the actual how far does that heat need to travel in some sort of distance Finally, there's the delta T term, there's a hot temperature and a cold temperature, and this will be the positive difference of those two values. Note that Q over T, and I mentioned this on the previous slide, is joules over second. It's an amount of energy over time, which we know is also a watt. The problem I picked out for us is an ideal example of conduction. An iron poker is placed in a fire with a temperature of 502 degrees Celsius and the other is kept at a temperature of 26 degrees. So we have in the fire and in the room. The poker is 1.2 meters long and has a radius of five millimeters. Ignoring heat lost along the length of the poker, so we're not losing anything to the environment, just all along the poker the heat is going to transfer. Find the amount of heat conducted from one end of the poker to the other in five seconds. Okay, so it wants an amount of heat conducted. So we're solving for Q in the problem. And let's get an idea of what's going on here. I'm going to enlarge the poker a little bit because the length and the radius are not proportional here. So they tell us that there's a radius. And what I'm going to know is that it is involved in calculating the area over which this heat is being transferred. There is also a distance over which the heat is being transferred. And there is a T1 on this side and a T2 on this side. So we could calculate a difference in temperature. The last thing I need is the thermal conductivity of iron. And if you look back on a previous slide, you will see that iron has 80 joules per second meters squared degrees Celsius. And I'm going to note that we're also in Celsius, it's not Kelvin. So whatever temperature difference I calculate, it'll be fine in there. So Q, I'm going to do a little bit of algebra and move that time to the other side. K A delta T over D all times the time. And I can plug in these values. I get 80 times the area. Well, the area is going to be pi r squared for this poker. So I'm going to have pi times 5 times 10 to the negative third quantity squared. Remember, we're in millimeters here, so I'm going to convert that to meters. So that's the area term. And delta t is going to be 502 minus 26. I'm going to divide that all by the distance, 1.2, and multiply by 5 seconds in order to get the total amount of heat, about 12.5 joules, which isn't a lot. It's only 5 seconds on a rather poor conductor here. Maybe that's why we use iron for an iron poker is because it's cheap on some level, but it doesn't connect. Conduct well. Maybe safer than a wooden stick. The second method of heat transfer is by convection. Convection is defined as a massive amount of a substance with a greater amount of thermal energy moving into a cooler region. And so heat is carried within the substance, right? The whole substance moves. It's not the heat that is moved from one molecule to another in the substance. It's that all of this big mass of a substance moves and carries heat into an area. So we can see that with this convection example from the text OpenStax College Physics. There's a fire and you can see that hot air rises. Hot air is less dense than cool air so it will rise and so we get heat being transferred up towards the ceiling and therefore cool air is sinking down to the ground and so that's how you get this convection going on this is how a convection oven would work is a large mass of air that's been heated is circulating around this is also the reason why you would want to put a fan in your room to force the hot air down, otherwise it would just stay at the top. And this is also why upper levels of a building are warmer is because the hot air rises. 
Other examples of convection include ocean currents such as the Gulf Stream, where large amounts of water flow along the ocean floor or up above near the surface to carry large masses of water from one part of the ocean to another. It's not that the heat transferred through the molecular bouncing around heat transfer, but whole masses of water moved along. We also see convection with rising air. Very hot air near the surface of the planet will rise upward towards lower temperature and lower pressure regions in the atmosphere. This is the idea of forced air heating, just to blow air into a room, and that's how you get heat into the room, is just to blow hot air into it. You will see only conceptual questions about this. There's no quantitative relationships that I will introduce to you regarding this convection material. The third process of heat transfer is radiation by which we mean heat transfer through emission or absorption of electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves is the same thing as light, and that's why you see a picture of a fire here. Not only is the fire hot, but it is also radiating light, which we see. It's light that we can see. There's also light in the spectrum that we cannot see, various wavelengths of light. And what we see is the light leaves a hot object and travels through space. Cooler objects may get in the way and absorb this energy and thus increase their energy. Here we have a Boltzmann distribution for the wavelength of light. We can see that nanometers wavelength of light and the electromagnetic energy. And for hotter objects, we're going to have higher energy, lower wavelength light being emitted from it. Examples of radiation. Well, any hot object, you for instance, have radiation coming from you. Uh, another simple example is one in your kitchen, a microwave. Maybe you have a microwave in your kitchen and that emits radiation to heat objects. Here's the quantification of radiation. You can see all the variables in there and we'll go through that. What I wanted to note is that again, any object with a temperature is radiating. And we can see this picture from the Open Sachs College Physics book that this is a building, you can see that there's some hotter areas and colder areas. So even though you can't see that it's hot, this building is definitely radiating heat. If you went and stood next to the building, it would be warm. And if you have the right measuring device, as you see here, you could measure the amount of heat radiated from it. Radiation is also like conduction measured as a rate and we see that there is an amount of energy per unit time. There's some variables over here. Let's talk about those. Sigma here, sigma, this is Greek letter sigma. It's a lowercase sigma. 5.67 times 10 to the negative eighth. I like remembering that one. It's five, six, seven, eight, and make sure that you remember the little stuff in between. Is known as the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And see the units here. When I plug it in here, I'm going to multiply by seconds and meters squared and t to the fourth and have joules left over. So that's the units on the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Again, Q is the heat transfer, T is the time period. E, here's the E here, is the coefficient of emissivity of the material. It's a dimensionless quantity and it's between zero and one. Black bodies, emissivity is one and they are very emissive. They don't have any restraints to their emissivity. A shiny or white or perfect reflector, a perfect reflector has an emissivity of zero. It doesn't take any heat in and it doesn't let any heat out. You can think of that in sleeping bags for camping. It doesn't let any heat out. Real objects have values between zero and one. We have a surface area over which the heat is being transferred, and this is the same with conduction, and the temperature of the radiating body, whatever the temperature of this radiating body is, and I'm going to note that the temperature must be in Kelvin. Make sure you're changing over to Kelvin when you do this. So that's a rate at which a single object 
emits radiation. We can have radiation pass between two objects. This may be more of interest. For instance, if you're in cold water, you want to know how fast, how much time you have before you suffer hypothermia. What's the rate at which you lose heat to your environment? So we have an amount of heat transferred. There's the QT, and I put T for transferred here between the two objects. It's a very similar equation to the one on the previous slide, but notice that we have a temperature difference here. One is always the hotter object, and two is always the colder object. So you are emitting heat to the water and your environment. So this would be you, and this would be the water. Again, here's the symbols of all the quantities. We have the Stefan-Boltzmann constant. We have the emissivity of the object, an area over which the heat is being transferred, and the two temperatures. And again, both of these temperatures will be in Kelvin. When you use this equation, make sure your temperatures are in Kelvin. The problem I picked out for us to exemplify radiation is burning off dessert. A person eats a dessert that contains 250 calories, and this is a big C calorie. The skin temperature of this individual is 36 degrees Celsius, and that of her environment is 21 degrees Celsius. The emissivity of her skin is 0.75. I'm going to write some of this down real quick while I'm going along. 0.75, and her surface area is 1.3. So I'm just identifying these quantities, the emissivity area. There's a couple of temperatures given. I'm going to remember to convert those to Kelvin in order to use them in my equation. It asks, how much time would it take for her to emit a net radiation energy from her body that is equal to the energy contained in the dessert? How long would it take to burn this off as temperature into the environment? Let's convert the temperatures while we're at this to uh, T1 will be the hot, so we're going to do 273.15 plus 36, so this will equal 309.15 Kelvin. T2 is the colder one, so I'm going to go 273.15 plus 21, and that will be 294.15 Kelvin. So we have those to go into the equation. They want us to solve for how much time. So I'm going to algebraically solve this equation for t. If I multiply by t on both sides and divide by this expression on both sides, that will give me the equation. So t will equal q divided by e sigma a t1 to the fourth minus t2 to the fourth power. The heat transferred will be the amount of energy in the dessert. And I see that I'm given 250 big C calories. I'm going to note that one big C calorie is equal to a thousand little C calories. And each little C calorie is 4.186 joules. So a thousand little C calories is going to be 4,186 joules. So I can do that conversion up here. Q will be 250 big C calories. And I'm going to multiply by 486 joules for one little C calorie. I'm going to divide by all the quantities down here. I have a 0.75 for the emissivity. Sigma is the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, so that's 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8 joules per, there's a lot of units in there, I'm going to leave those out for now. The area, they tell us, is 1.3, and then I'm going to include these temperatures in this expression. So I have 309.15 to the fourth power minus 294.15 to the fourth power. Please note, and don't do this, that is not the same as 309 minus 294 quantity to the fourth power. Those are not the same thing, so don't do that. That's not correct. Okay, so when I run this through the calculator, I get 11,500 seconds. And you divide by 3,600. Remember, there's 3,600 seconds in an hour. This turns out to be 3.2 hours. So three hours and about 12 minutes it takes to just release the heat from this dessert 
into the air of the room. 